again a welcome. Praise be to God. We are so, so blessed. I don't know what you've faced this week. I don't know what you've listened to on the news. I don't know what news has been coming over the internet to you. But I come maybe in the face of that to tell you today, we are blessed. Just to remind you, we are blessed. We are so blessed of God. Today we're going to continue with the series that we started out with for January 2020, with the Sermon on the Mount. We've already had the first Beatitude, and today we're going to take up with the second Beatitude. But I want you to know something from the very beginning, and I want you to celebrate that. My brothers and sisters, the fight of faith is on. The fight of faith is on. We are not in our houses fearing the virus. We have been dispersed to our houses, not disbanded. We remain within our homes as as, Noah did within the ark, as Moses himself did within the ark upon that river Nile. We may be in containment. You cannot contain the faith that God has put within us. And that faith we are employing in prayer as we stand against this virus, as we stand up between the people and that plague that comes against them. I thank you and I praise you, Lord. We are blessed. Amen? The sermon we're looking at is the greatest sermon that has ever been preached. The Sermon on the Mount. This sermon was preached by the greatest grace preacher there has ever been. And I want you to note that. So many people, when they read this portion of scripture, they seem to interpret it as being a New Testament version of the Old Testament laws, the Ten Commandments. Yes, there is a comparison, but no. No, 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 no. The Beatitudes are not laws for which we must abide in order to end rewards. You will see as we continue to go through these, the Beatitudes, which are our focus presently, these eight truths build one upon another to form a staircase to the high life that God has called us to. One upon another, they take a step after step up into that abundant life that Jesus has called us to. The Beatitudes, they are not rewards for works, they are gifts of grace. Now let's turn our attention to the second Beatitude. Matthew chapter 4, sorry, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 4. Blessed are they that mourn, but they shall be comforted. What? I can hear you say. We're in the midst of a crisis. We need cheering up. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. We're going to look at this. We're going to have a look and see what the text means. We're going to see again our challenge to change. And we're going to look at that promised reward. But today, I cannot stress highly enough the relevance of the Bible to the situation we are in today. This series of messages that the Lord has ordained for us, for our fellowship, for 2020, are exactly what we need to face this crisis that the world faces right now. Fear is being propagated everywhere. The fight of faith is on. Those of you who have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, that you're using to talk to everyone around the world and your family, etc., with it, I implore you, from today, and for those of you that are already doing it, I congratulate you and celebrate you. From today, please take that wonderful weapon that God has placed into your hand, that tool of communication, and propagate faith. Let the fight of faith begin, because it is on. There are conspiracy theories, both credible and incredible, and they're the daily diet of the lost. But our diet is the truth. His truth that never returns to him void. His truth that positions us for victory. Remember Psalm 91? Let's turn there. 
Psalm 91 speaks so much of how God is positioning us for victory. Verse 1. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and in Him will I trust. Surely, He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be a shield and buckler. What a promise. In the midst of this crisis, in the midst of this threat that is all around us, people have withdrawn to their houses in order to keep themselves shut in from a virus that is on the outside, and yet within that house, you too have been shut in under the shadow of the Almighty. When I close my eyes, I can almost see and feel the feathers that surround me. I feel the strength of the fortress. I know the surety of the refuge. I know that my God no matter what happens, surely, he says, surely, guaranteed, he will deliver me from the snare of the fowler, from that coronavirus, from that trap of Satan that is out there. He will deliver me, and from that noisome pestilence that is virulent throughout the world, he will deliver us under his wings. We trust. And his truth, my brothers and sisters, the word of God, is our shield and our buckler. Instantly, the shield of faith that we hold. Remember, F-A-I-T-H, the shield of faith. Its use is to foil the adversary's intention to harm. The Lord not only gives us his word as a shield, he gives it to us as a buckler. And a buckler is a smaller shield the larger shield was used when the enemy was attacking all of us. But now that we have been isolated into our own homes and it's come down to one-to-one -to -one combat at times, up comes the buckler, the smaller shield, that which is designed for one-to-one -one combat. You may have symptoms coming at you. You may have feelings. You may have thoughts that you may be going to succumb to this virus. Your big shield of faith may feel heavy with all the fiery darts of the devil. Take up the word of God that is also your buckler. And in that one-to-one -one combat, know this. Victory is assured if you will stay under the shadow of the Almighty. The fight of faith is on. And we will emerge victorious. Praise God. For this sermon of true grace has all that we need to set us aright in the troubles that are around us, and not just that. These beatitudes will cause us to prosper in the midst of trouble. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. What a wonderful paradox. It's like saying, happy are those who who are sad. Yet within it, within this one verse, is another key to the abundant life. Blessed, we know, means to be empowered to prosper, to be approved of God. Approved of God are those who mourn. The second beatitude builds upon the first one. Blessed are the poor in spirit that deal, dealt with the intellectual, the revelation that is received that leads us to acknowledge our spiritual bankruptcy before God, leads now to the emotional outcome in our own souls as we engage the consequence of that revealed truth. Blessed are those that are poor in spirit. When we came to that revelation that we ourselves are destitute, of self. We must be destitute of self. We must acknowledge our own sin or our need of our Savior before us. 
And having come to that knowledge that we are in so much need of our Savior, it brings us face to face with our own sin. And then begins the second beatitude. Blessed are those who mourn. Mourning is the emotional consequence of the intellectual understanding and revelation that we are poor in spirit. But what is this mourning? Well, firstly, it's not being miserable, nor is it to be morose or sullen or solemn. And you'd be forgiven for thinking that, because some Christians make it their lifetime's pursuit to look as if they've had their whole family wiped out. Being a Christian does not mean running about with no smile on your face. I know it's often pointed out by people that there is no record of Jesus ever laughing in the Bible. But you only have to have a look at the body of Christ that he chose to see that he had a sense of humor. You can look at the disciples themselves and he could not have helped but have a few laughter lines at the end of it. Jesus is not calling us here to mourn in the manner of which we normally understand. This mourning is neither is it self-pity. Those who mourn, woe is me, nothing ever works out for me. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He's not talking about sadness that comes when things don't work out our way. He's not blessed are those who mourn and are always depressed and always down and always whinging that things don't work out. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. Nor is he primarily addressing the natural mourning that accompanies bereavement. You see, we've got to see what Scripture says and understand what it says. And please, and when we do, we've got to stop applying it blindly to situations. You know, people say, especially at funerals, blessed are those who mourn, but they shall be comforted. Well, the blessed starts off meaning happy. Happy are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. And if you're happy that someone died, you're not mourning. You're just being. Jesus isn't talking about that kind of mourning. He's talking about spiritual mourning. And what does that look like? Spiritual mourning happens when we call sin, sin, finally, and stop frustrating grace. Remember, this sermon is a sermon of grace. It's not a sermon of law. It is a sermon of grace. Pastor Ibrahim, on a men's day of prayer, used a phrase, and I hope he doesn't mind me borrowing it. He said, we must not mistake mercy for approval. So often, we as believers allow ourselves to indulge in sin repetitively. And when we first don't get found out for it, or don't suffer a consequence immediately for it, we fool ourselves into believing that God is now approving of it. No, my brothers and sisters, that's mercy. Mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. It's not approval of what you've just done. Mercy is when God gives you time to repent, not the leisure to continue to commit the sin. Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense, are not a license to sin. So many times I hear people complain that when a preacher preaches about sin or points out the sin in a situation, oh, that's just legalistic. My brothers and sisters, grace is not a license to sin and mercy is not a sign of approval. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We mourn when we realize the true nature of our sin. The true nature, the true consequence of the sins that we commit, 
when you fall out with your spouse, when you are heavy-handed with a peer or a child, when you steal from another, when you break a covenant or a promise, whatever the sin is, the first and foremost person hurt in that situation is God. When we realize what sin is, sin is first and foremost an act against God. David knew this. In Psalm 51, he wrote, Have mercy on me, O God. King David, Elijah. King David, the powerful warrior of Israel. King David, mourning before God. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. Against thee, and thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. David, he's showing us the way that this beatitude is to be applied to a believer's life. He's broken before God. He's not broken for the consequence of his sin, in the sense that something else will now bad happen. But instead, David is broken because he has realized against thee and the only God have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Lord, not only have I done it, but I've done it whilst you're watching and I've done it and it harms you and you alone. You are the focus, my God. David is confessing his sin, yes. But he's also contrite about that sin. You see, confession is one thing, but contrition is another. I remember as a child, young man, I was discovered doing something I shouldn't have been doing at school. And the headmaster had it investigated and the teachers talked to me about it, etc. They asked me, did I do it? Was it me that committed the act? I said, yes, yes. Finally, I put my hand up and said, yes, I did do it. And the teacher dragged me before the headmaster, and I think the teacher had a little bit of a soft spot for me. So the teacher said to the headmaster, um, Brogan's not a bad boy, sir. He's confessed, he's admitted to what he has done. And she thought that would be the end of the matter. Now that I had confessed, I would be free to go. I kind of hope that would be the same way myself. But the headmaster had more wisdom. The headmaster thanked the teacher and then looked at me. And he said, Brogan, is this true? Do you confess? Did you do it? I said, yes, sir, I did. And then the wisdom he applied. He said, Brogan, would you do it again? And I said, yes, sir, I would do it again. You see, I had confessed, but I was not contrite. There is a difference between admitting your sin and being broken because of it. Blessed are those who mourn, spiritual mourning. Mourning begins when we realize that sin is first and foremost against God. When we finally admit to ourselves the sins that we commit, when we stop dressing them up as quirks of our character. I'm just an angry person. I don't mean to be angry, I just am. I'm a very inquisitive person. I don't mean to question everything, but I just do. I'm whatever excuse it is we want to come up with. Mourning begins when we start taking responsibility for sin, our own sin. 
you think the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, the great writer of the New Testament, almost two-thirds of it, a man who would be walking by faith in front of us all, one that we should follow, one that we all looked up to, one that we all read his works and wonder how such great faith this man has. And yet Paul is just like the rest of us. In Romans chapter 7 he wrote, from verse 20, Now if I do what I would not, it is no more that I do it, but the sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am! Paul here is mourning. Paul, a wretched man that I am, that should be the mantra of us all as believers. Oh, wretched person that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? This body that loves this body, this mind, this will, this emotion, that seems to do everything contrary to what God is asking me to do. Oh, wretched man am I. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Paul came to that recognition, that understanding. We all sin. And in doing so, God is so faithful. He is so just. He wants to forgive us as soon as we confess. It is the longing of his heart. But he asks us, to take the step to mourn over our sin because that and that alone will bring the comfort that he promises. We can all privately empathize with Paul. We've all faced wars in the flesh. Parents, picture this. When your children are small, and they do something for which you begin to tell them off. And all of a sudden they realize that they've offended you, that they've caused a problem with you, and they come into your presence and they stay there. They're mournful. They're sorry that they did it. But remember, remember those instances. The child always stays there until reconciliation has come to pass. They will not leave your presence until they know all is right again between you and them. That's the morning that Jesus is calling us to. Not that we sit there berating ourselves or beating ourselves about the sin that is in our life, but rather that we recognize for what it is, that it is against God, that it is harm, that it is against His will, that we bring it before the Father, knowing faithfully He will forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness, but we stay there because we want nothing more than to ensure that reconciliation is achieved and that right standing with God is restored. That is the heart of a true believer. Morning, it prompts prayer. When I think of the sins that I've committed, and I've shared with you this before, I ask the Lord to remind me. The sound of metal on metal. I remember as I watch those movies where Jesus is crucified on the cross, and this man, this sinful man, takes that great hammer and pounds those nails into his hand. And the noise of the metal on metal has stuck with me. And it serves to help me, first of all, not to sin. But secondly, if I do, to mourn. To mourn the cost that I see before me as he hung on that cross. Morning. It brings an end to the slavery of sin. Your 
you're in your home today. Not many people can see you. Today, you can never think of the sins that have kept you safe. Sins that have dogged you most of your life or for a very, very long time. Maybe an addiction. Mourning destroys the yoke of bondage that Satan has placed on you. Your mourning before God will destroy the power of that sin in your life. But it's not just about us four no more. The mourning goes deeper than that. Once we mourn over our own private sin, and brothers and sisters, let, let's, let's just make this clear. When we mourn over our sins, it really shouldn't take us long. There shouldn't be a huge back catalogue. We should be living righteously. So when we go to prayer and mourning becomes part of it, the bit where we're involved, that should be rather short. But we are to mourn not only over our own sin, but the sins of the world. Look at the mess the world is in. This virus hasn't come out of nowhere. The wages of sin are death. And this planet has been extracting those wages since creation. The Holy Spirit of God, the Restrainer, has held back catastrophe after catastrophe. But we are in the midst of something right now. Something that God has not been taken by surprise by. But instead, in the midst of this, is calling us back to restored living, to righteous living to help us as a church worldwide, but individuals as well, to stand before him with clean hands and clean hearts. But he's calling us also to mourn over the sins of the world. Jesus did it. Jesus wept over Jerusalem when it rejected him. He didn't mourn because it rejected him. He mourned over Jerusalem because of the consequences that would come upon Jerusalem because of their foolishness. Jesus wept before the Father for Jerusalem, not for himself, not that he was let down, not that someone didn't choose him, not for his own end, but instead he wept for the same people that rejected him, those who wanted nothing to do with him. He cried over them. This world has so much sin that should break our hearts. The wars, the murders, the thefts, the total rejection of God by society. I remind you, crisis. When we were in Zimbabwe, the Lord broke that word down for us. C-R-I-S-I-S. We asked, Lord, why? Why crisis? Why do these things happen? He said, well, it's when Christ is removed in situations in society. And Christ has been removed from society. We should be mourning over that. Not simply because Christians don't get their own way, but because those who don't see the way are lost. They have lost Christ. They have removed him from their society, and now they are lost without him. They are in crisis. Our mourning is to be for them. But do these things break our heart? Or have we allowed ourselves to be conditioned by the sinful world and all of its views? As a child, I, I remember many years ago, I seen a famine in Africa on the television. And noting how the images adversely affected my family and my peers. And for some time, the injustice and the misfortune of all of those events they, they marked our psyche. Thousands of miles away, we'd never seen Africans. And yet we were touched by the images that the television brought to us. They marked us. But time trundles on. And now today, such images have very little impact on society. There's a plethora of channels that will show you 
things going on around the world, where there is children caught in conflict or in famine, and we only flick through the channels whilst we're looking for something to entertain us. As I speak to you, the horrific fact of death surrounds us. I'm not speaking about the virus. That has killed less than 30,000 people worldwide since January. I'm not belittling that, that's 30,000 people, far too many. But let's keep it in context. At present, from January, 30,000 people have been wiped out by this virus. But the horror of abortion in the same time frame since January this year, we as a human group have murdered 10 million children. 10 million. If you can think of nothing more to mourn before God, that one sin, that one sin, please don't mishear what I'm saying. When we mourn before God, it is not in judgment over those involved in it. It is for mercy for them. We're not to sit in judgment over a woman who's caught in a situation where she believes or she's advised that an abortion is what's necessary. We are to cry out to God for mercy for her and for mercy for all that are involved in the machinations of it. But things need to be understood. 30,000 from a virus, we are hiding worldwide within our houses in case this virus gets us. And at the same time, uninterrupted almost, 10 million children have been aborted. May God have mercy. Mourning has depth. It's not some shadow religious experience as some people call faith. It's not. Mourning doesn't come from people who these days are complaining that they can't go to church, that beforehand came whenever they felt like it. It's not for the hatch, the match and the dispatch goers, those who only come to church or before God for a christening, baby dedication, a marriage or a funeral. You know, it's very telling what we weep over and what we laugh at. True Christianity, Jesus says, is marked by our mourning over sin. And remember, this is how salvation works. God saves repentant sinners. Repentant sinners are those who acknowledge the horror of their sin and their need of a saviour. And forgiveness follows that change in them. You see, we have changed the gospel, brothers and sisters, as an aside. Because you, the ministers of reconciliation, the ministers out there on the front line, let's just, let's just do a, a little check here to ensure that the gospel message we are putting out there is the truth. Let's not dilute the gospel in the midst of a crisis. We need the truth to get out there. God saves repentant sinners. He doesn't save people who just pray a prayer and want to join a club. He, repentance is necessary. Forgiveness follows the repentance. And saints of God must never leave that understanding. We ourselves, having been saved, having tasted of the goodness of God, do you remember? Do you remember when you came to Jesus? Do you remember the burden of the sin that you realized? Do you remember feeling the weight of what it was that you needed a Savior to save you from? But that is something we must never lose. Because having been saved, having repented, we are now to stay the true course that salvation sets, focusing on Jesus looking unto him, the author and the finisher, the perfecter of our faith. When we sin, we must run to God, not from him. 1 John 1, 9, we, we all confess and we all love it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. If we confess our sins, we know he is faithful and just 
to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. But it's preceded and followed by two verses that we must not leave out. Verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and the word is not in us. Oh, brothers and sisters, denial of sin makes forgiveness impossible. If we will not mourn over our sin, if we will not face our sin, if we continue to dress it up, excuse it, and pass it off, denial of sin makes forgiveness impossible. Spiritual mourning is a gift of grace. Jesus didn't stand on that mountain to depress people. He came to show them the way to the high life. Spiritual mourning alleviates guilt. It frees us from the snare of the fowler. Guilt, that thing that has held us all down, that thing that has held us all back, mourning before God over our sin, frees us from guilt. It frees us, as you remember in Psalm 91 from the snare of the fowler. Now the verb mourn in the Greek is in the continuous sense. It's mourning that is ongoing or perpetual. It's not a one-off experience, but it's a lifestyle that the believer must be in in regard to sin. It's a lifestyle. Mourning before God is not a one-off. It's not a monthly thing. It's something that we should be before God. If we sin, we should be mourning before God for it. The heart of a kingdom believer is contrite. Remember we said this second at Beatitude. Climbs upon the first. It's form a foundation that gives it strength. The Apostle Paul models this for us in Philippians 3 and 4 to 9. Paul, a man who could say this before anyone else could, though I might also have confidence in my flesh. If any other man thinks that he has thereof to be my trust in his flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day, as the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Jesus Christ, the righteousness which is of God, by faith. Destitute of self, Paul then was able to declare himself chief among sinner, sinners in 1 Timothy 1. Chief among sinners, a man who had just spoken of a pedigree that was second to none, having come to the realization of poverty of spirit, he declared himself chief among sinners, and doubtless, he had the martyrdom of Stephen on his mind, whilst he moaned. As Paul himself had stood by and looked after the coats of those who killed Stephen. Paul mourned over his sin, and he was comforted. We are to mourn. Not, not for our loss of goods or chattel, but for our loss of self-respect and righteousness. Mourn for our loss of witness our loss of purity. You see, when we sin, the world looks at us aghast and doesn't listen to the gospel, just like we ask. We lose the power of our witness. We lose the shine of our purity. Blessed are those who mourn. It's time, whilst we're in our own heart, we have time now. 
Time to come before God. Time to acknowledge our sin. Time to confess it. Time to mourn it. Time to be free from it. Time to be empowered because God wants to comfort us. God wants to bring us a comfort. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This reward, the comfort we are promised, is immediate and it is continual. Comfort follows mourning, which follows poverty of spirit. So believers who have sinned, they are forgiven upon confession and repentance and then comforted. God wants to comfort us, to free us from guilt, to free us from condemnation. Romans 8, 1, there is therefore no condemnation. No condemnation. Repentance is the sea change that allows comfort to flow. If you're suffering with guilt, if you are trying to excuse your sin as something that you are powerless over, the good news is the Lord is awaiting you, not with judgment, but with comfort. He says, come to me, mourn over your sin, and allow me to comfort you. You are my child, allow me to comfort you. I am not angry with you, and I am here. I have given my son for you. Allow me to comfort you. The verb comfort comes from the same root. The word that describes the Holy Spirit is our paraclete. He is the one who comes alongside. God's comfort was to speak peace to our troubled minds. God's comfort was to bring healing to our deeply scarred souls. Comfort, it's exclusive to believers. It's immediate. It's continuous. And it's personal. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Mourning doesn't bring you down. It lifts you up. Up into the arms of your Father. And all purity, Thomas Watson said, a true mourner makes haste to meet God, as Jacob did his brother. And the present that he sends before is the sacrifice of his tears. Isn't that beautiful? Jacob, when he was returning to the land, was afraid to meet his son, because he didn't know what would happen. Sometimes we're afraid to meet with God, because we're afraid of what might happen. Jacob sent the gift before him to pacify Esau. The gift we can send before us are our tears, which are so valuable to God. The brothers and sisters, as I close, Jesus moved. David moved. Our capacity to weep is for this world, not the next. There, there shall be no tears. But the tears that we shed in mourning are not tears of frustration, but tears of faith. Faith that we believe that our God is true. Faith that we believe that our God is just. Not only to forgive us of our sins, but to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That, my brothers and sisters, is the gift of grace. Grace extends to us the opportunity to receive the comfort of the Almighty, continually, immediately, and personally. We will be comforted to know that we are restored to right standing, that the Holy Spirit is active in our lives as He convicts us of sin. We will be comforted to know that we have a faithful advocate before the throne, Jesus our advocate, the Holy Spirit, His very presence before God, our comforter. We will be comforted to know that we have been forgiven and cleansed, that we abide continually under the shadow of the Almighty, who will deliver us from.
all that we face today. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all today. We have received the gift of grace, the gift of His Word. I ask that we would continue in this week to mourn before God for our own sins and the sins of the world. The fight of faith is on. Our tears are a weapon against that which seeks to destroy the world we know. We can reach out in God's mercy as he comforts us and gives us the words to speak to your neighbors throughout this week, to your family on Facebook and the other platforms. Seek God. Seek God. Repent, mourn, and be comforted. Now we have the opportunity to take our tithes and offerings as we did last week. Again, physically, you cannot be here. Please watch this message and you will receive the information that is necessary. May God bless you as you give. Hey Church, Austin here again with a short message with regards to our tithes and offerings over the coming weeks. Normally, on a Sunday, we would use these envelopes, but as we can't physically meet at the moment, we're relying upon digital means to facilitate our giving. All you need to do is go to our website at www.kingschurchministries.org, click on the home menu, click giving, scroll down to the bottom of the page and click Chatham to reveal the bank details. With those, you can set up a standing order, a direct debit, or if you want online banking, you can make a direct payment. If you use Tithe and if you know your Tithe number as the reference, that would really help. I'll just finish with this. Malachi 3 verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open up the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Amen. We may not be able to physically go to the storehouse at the moment, but with the internet, we can still fill it. God has given us the tools in which to do so. So with that, God bless you. Thanks for watching this and I'll see you again soon. Thank you. May God bless you as you have given this prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just want to thank you, Lord, that you would accept from us our tithes and our offerings. Lord, we come in obedience to your word and we thank you that we sit under windows that are open in heaven, pouring out blessings that we have not got room to contain. Lord, whilst the world around them stockpile stuff that will rot and rust, instead, my God, in you we trust, and we thank you and we praise you, that according to your riches in Christ Jesus, we have all that we need. For that we give you praise, we give you honor, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, lastly, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've heard the gospel, I'm sure, from your friends, or you've caught light of it today. Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago, died on a cross to set you free. Before you ever knew anything about him, you were on his mind. He loves you. The Father loves you so much that he asked his own son to come and save you. The spirit of the living God is here. He is where you are right now. And he is ready to bring you to the place where you have greater understanding as a sacrifice that has been made for you. Sin keeps us all from God in the beginning. Sin is the barrier between God and man. It left a great gulf between the Father and his children. But Jesus Christ came to cure that gulf. 
He stretched his arms out on the cross and he joined the hands of God and man through his sacrifice. But that sacrifice cost. He paid the price for your sin and for mine. I can assure you, mine will be much greater than yours. He paid the price. I asked you today, do you recognize that? Do you understand the price that has been paid for you? And are you ready? Are you ready to thank him for saving you from the depths of your sin, for saving you from the hell that you are about to, for changing your direction? He is ready to do this right now. Are you ready to repent? Are you ready to change? You don't need the power to. He will bring the power to. But you must make the determination. You must confess before him. If you're ready, God is always ready. If you're ready, just bow your head. Father, in the name of Jesus, you who see every thought and intent of every heart, Father, we before you. We ask for your mercy. Lord, we ask for forgiveness for our brothers and sisters here. We ask, Lord, that by the power of your Spirit, you would touch those who are contrite of heart and remove them, Father, from the kingdom of darkness, translating them into the kingdom of your dear Son. And, Father, that today, that they would begin their mourning, that would continue throughout their lives, that they would have an abhorrence for sin from this day forward. Lord, that they would never, from this moment forward, be anything more than lovers of God and haters of sin. Comfort them, my Father. Comfort them as you promised. Comfort them with the gift of grace that you give us through this beatitude. Lord, let them know the beauty of blessed are those who mourn, but they shall be comforted. If you've prayed that prayer today, if you have come to the understanding of your sin and your need of the Savior, please watch this following message. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. We really hope you were blessed by the message. If you responded, to that prayer, um, or if you didn't, but you've got more questions, please get in touch with us. Uh, we've made an email available to be monitored by Pastor Paul, which is firststeps at kingschatton.org. So please send us an email, get in touch, any questions, no matter how silly you think they are. If you want to know more, send an email to that, that address and we're more than happy to get in contact with you. Thank you.